Welcome to my introduction to networking course, typically abbreviated ITN. This will be for the CCNA version 7 curriculum. Module 8, the network layer. And what we're going to be doing in this layer is talking about IP packets and about routing. So IP packets come in both IPv4 and IPv6. And we're going to be talking about how the router makes decisions on path selection. That's essentially what routing is. So what are some of the basic characteristics of the network layer? Well, this is where we take a segment from layer four and we encapsulate it into a packet. The four major areas that the network layer performs is the addressing for source and destination, the destination being an external address outside of our LAN, encapsulation and decapsulation, and lastly, routing. And again, routing is just a clever way of saying path selection or path determination from our source to our destination outside of our LAN. So why IPv4 and IPv6? What happened to IPv5? IPv5 did not take off. It was a giant flop, so it just isn't discussed anymore. But there is a version 5 out there that doesn't run, doesn't work. So 4 and 6 are the primary IP versions. So let's talk about encapsulation. So again, a segment from layer 4, the transport layer, will become the data for our packets. Our packet will then put on our IP header. Keep in mind, if we're doing any type of uh, address translation, NAT, uh, the destination and source addressing may be slightly different, but the IP headers where source and destination address information will be going. Characteristics of IP in both versions is it's connectionless, it's best effort, and it doesn't care what layer two technology you're using. So it doesn't matter if you're using Ethernet or a frame relay or any other form of layer one or layer two uh, connectivity. All it cares is that it knows to dump the IP packet into a frame and it's a layer two issue from there. So connectionless, what does that mean? Connectionless is basically best effort. No establishment, it just sends the packets. If you get it, great. If you don't, oh well. If you don't get it, I don't get a notification that it wasn't received. So again, best effort. As data flows through a network, some packets may get lost. That's okay. Again, best effort means no acknowledgement. It will recover the best it can and just kind of move forward. So what does it mean by media independent or layer two independent? It doesn't mean that it has to use the same media across the network. Again, it can use different type of layer two technologies for transporting of data. It can use different layer one technologies for the actual physical connections. It does not matter. Layer three, as it takes the packet, will give the packet to a frame, and the frame deals with the connectivity from there. IP packets don't care how they get there. That's not its role. So another part of the media independent is layer two will actually have a maximum transmission unit, MTU, and basically the frame knows what size it should be and so does the packets. So the packet may chunk itself up before it goes down to layer two, thus allowing the network layer to chunk up its size as opposed to the frame layer 
data link layer, chunking down its size. Oftentimes, the network will establish the appropriate MTU size so that all media throughout the network is using the same size. And realistically, 1500-ish bytes is the standard MPU size. Though it could be slightly bigger, slightly smaller, but normally MTU by default is about 1500 bytes. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the individual IPv4 packets because we have to talk about each packet type. They are slightly different, so we have to address them differently. IPv4 is the primary communication standard still used in the US. Basically, it provides the header, the structure of how a IPv4 packet will be uh, sent, how it will be organized. This allows for standard communication, meaning it's going to the correct destination. It knows how to process certain uh, packets. Is the packet actually going to the right location with the right priority? Things of that nature. All of this is stored in that layer three data frame. Or, I'm sorry, that layer three header before it's to get packaged into a data frame. So what does a PyPv4 packet header look like? Here it is. First things you'll notice is a version number then some type of header length, then some type of priority, then a total length for the entire packet. We have an identification, some flags, some uh, time to live, a header checksum to make sure the header is correct. We have a source and destination address as well. So again, here we're looking at things like the version, the protocols, time to live, source and destination addresses. They're the big ones. So the version is going to be what version of IPv that you're running. Is it version four or version six? See, the funny part is the second one is the differential services. That is prioritization, QoS. Check some, basically make sure that the header is not corrupted. TTL or time to live, basically between each hop, the TTL will be decremented by one thus making sure that packets don't live forever. They can only jump between so many layer three networks before the packet is discarded. The protocol being what is the higher layer protocol? What is the layer, of our, the layer four protocol? Is it TCP, is it UDP, so forth. And then source and destination address will be the appropriate IPv4 address for the source and then the destination being the location of where it's going. So moving on, we have our IPv6 packets. First of all, why do we have IPv6? Mainly because there are limitations for IPv4. Basically IPv4, we're losing addresses. They are being depleted. In America, we still have lots of IPv4 addresses, but globally, those addresses have basically been exhausted. Also, end-to-end -end connectivity is not there. Each home has private networks, meaning each of those private networks actually have a technology called NAT so that it takes these private addresses and get them a public address. I've already explained NAT in other videos, so if you have questions on NAT, shoot me a message, I'll send you the video on NAT translation. Essentially, NAT takes private addresses and converts them to a single public IP address. Well, that does not allow for end-to-end -end connectivity because if your router is actually NATing those addresses, we don't know what behind that router, which device is actually sending that communication. Only the router does. That is what it means by lack of end-to-end -end communication. IPv6 actually allows for end-to-end -end communication without the use of NAT. Why? Because IPv6 has way more many addresses. 
IPv4 has a few billion addresses. Well, IPv6 has a few undecillion addresses. So what is the difference? There are three undecillion grains of sand on our planet. And IPv6 allows for 340 undecillion addresses. So just to give you a scope of how large an undecillion number is, they're huge. Versus IPv4 with their few billion addresses. So IPv6 has way more addresses, so increased address space. No longer needing some form of address translation. And most importantly, packet handling has definitely been improved by a simplified header. So we already seen an IPv4 header and what that entails. So let's go ahead and look at an IPv6 header. While IPv6 header may be larger because of the address spaces, you'll see that it's not as bloated. We have a version, we have priority, we have a flow, we have payload length, that's the entire length of the packet. We have a next header, basically that's the well, higher layer protocol. We have a hop a limit, that's the TTL, and we have source and destination. Several fields have been removed from the IPv4 header because they were not needed. Version, again, IPv4 versus IPv6. Traffic class, again, priority. Flow label is basically how the device will handle identical flow labels. Basically, you can try to manipulate this for prioritization. It's not quite the same thing as QoS, but you can do different uh, flow labels to say this may be the same priority as these other packets, but do this functionality. Payload length is again the payload of the entire packet. Next header is again upper layer protocols, hop limits, the TTL, and source and destination. IPv6 addresses, not IPv4 addresses. Again, here we're talking IPv6. So these are IPv6 addresses, not IPv4 addresses. And again, the size of the address dictates that. IPv6 packets can also have a extensive header, an EH. Part of the EH characteristics is basically provide optional network layer information. Again, they're optional. And this is placed between the header and the payload. And this may also be used for fragmentation, and security. So unlike IPv4, routers do not typically fragment IPv6 packets. They use much larger packets. So now that we have a good understanding of how the routers route the information using IPv version 4 and version 6 options, how does the router actually take that information and use it? Now that we have a good understanding of the different characteristics for the two versions, how do they make decisions? So packets are always first created at the source, first of all, meaning the source will dictate where it's going, the destination. So each host device will create their own routing table. Each individual computer actually has a local route table. If the information is to leave that network, it needs to be sent to a default gateway. That will be on the LAN. The nice thing is to leave our personal LAN, our own personal network, we have to send it to our actual IP address. By default, the device will actually communicate with its link local address. That is abbreviated 127.0.0.1. That's just a clever way of saying, look at yourself. That is part of the local host. 
if you want to communicate with other local hosts on your network, that's going to be outside of your own personal network. We have to use our actual IP address, not our loopback address, one. And two, we're also going to be using our physical addresses, our MAC addresses. If we want to communicate with a remote host, we will still be using our IP addresses, but this time the destination address will denote that's not part of our network. It will have to be sent to our default gateway. That will be our exit point for our network. That will be part of the router. That's what the router's job is, is to take data from one network and transmit it to a different network. We will still be using our MAC addresses for that local connection. We will send our packets to our router, but how do we do that? Basically what we end up doing is we'll take our packet, before we send it on our medium, we will create a data frame, typically an ethernet frame, and our frame will have the source MAC address of our device and the destination MAC address of our router. That way it knows to send to our router. Our router will receive the frame, look at the frame, tear it off, look at the packet, and from that packet, it will make forwarding decisions. So the source of device will determine whether the destination is either local or remote. If it is remote, it has to go to our default gateway. Basically, this is done by looking at the IP address, looking at the subnet, and seeing if it's attached to the same network ID. If it's not part of the same network ID, send to default gateway. So what is a default gateway? Basically, a default gateway is a layer three device. It has to have a legitimate IP address in the same network range of your LAN. It will accept data frames from the LAN and it will make forwarding decisions on which path to take to the remote host. Basically, it provides the routing functionality to go to itself to a remote network. If a network has no default gateway, then no connectivity outside of your local network. So a host will know the default gateway either statically or dynamically. You can manually assign default uh, gateways or make it part of the DHCP process. IPv4 uses those two functionalities where IPv6 will send a DGW, it's a default gateway, through router solicitations. Basically, the router will say, hey, this is my address, and it will solicit all of the devices on the network using RS messages, or it can also be configured manually. The default gateway is a static route and it is also known as the last resort route in the routing table. Again, the purpose is if it's not part of our network, send to default gateway and it will figure out what to do with it. So what does our routing table look like on our hosts, on our computers? We could do a netstat tac r and you can see the route table it has. Here we have straight zeros. That's going to be our default gateway. And you'll notice that it even has a gateway column that all zeros go to. Basically, it's a clever way. If you don't know where to send it, send here. And then we have other matching portions, and that will tell you where to send them and the metric used. So we have destinations, we have our net masks, we have our gateways, interfaces, and metric. Again, metric being the cost of how to send the data. Metric also being the lowest one is the most preferred. 
So let's get into routing a little bit more in depth. What does routing actually do? Like what's the functionality of routing? Essentially, routing will take a packet from a LAN and it will transmit it to other routers. That is routing. It makes forwarding decisions. Do I send it out interface A or interface B? That's all part of that forwarding decision. So in this example, we have PC1 trying to communicate with I believe a PC2. What ends up happening is it's outside of our network. So we will create a packet, we will create a frame, and we will send it to our default gateway. Our default gateway, router one, will look at it, look at the data frame, strip it away, look at the packet, and it will look at the destination IPv4 address and it will figure out where it's supposed to go. If it is unsure, it will send it to its default gateway. If it actually matches a network, here we're trying to send things to the 10110 network, it will then know, oh, this network is attached to a another network on router two. Let's forward our packets to router two. And so we will then package our packet into a data frame using my exit interface on R1 as the source MAC address and the receiving interface on router two as the destination MAC address. And I will put it on the wire. Router two will get the, obtain the frame and router two will examine it strip off the frame and look at the packet header and realize that which interface to go out of what's really funny is this address is incorrect it should be 1011 not 1012 because you'll notice we're talking about that guy or or it could send it out this other interface, this guy right here, and that'll be to the internet. So the router two will have to make the decision which route to take. Because the designer of the PowerPoint did a typo, we know that it should be sending out this interface right here because this is the network it's supposed to be uh, tagged in. 10 1 2 not 10 1 1. But router two is what has to make the decision. Do I send it to the internet or do I send it to my other interface that has the attached network? That is what routing actually does. So there are different types of routing functionality. We have routes that are learned either directly connected and these are routes that are automatically added to the router and they are provided by the interface. They are active and they have an address. So directly connected networks have to have an address and must be on and active. We have remote networks and those are typically either learned through a routing protocol or statically assigned manually static dynamic routing protocol. And that is essentially, these are remote networks that we can say, oh, I know this network is attached to router two. I know how to get the router two. So anything destined for this remote network, I can send a router two. You will notice on the diagram, this is the directly connected network for router one. This is a directly connected network for router two. Sorry, also for router one. For router two, we still have that directly connected network for router two, and we have this network over here being directly connected to router two. So this middle network, this guy right here, 
is directly connected to both router 1 and router 2. This being a remote network for R1, this being a remote network for R2. And then we also have a default route. If we uh, have a network designed correctly, we will have a router act as a default gateway for the network that will send it outside of our internal network. Because we could have like a corporate network that allows for communication through our corporation without allowing internet access. Here, our default route will actually be sent to the internet, thus the default route. All right, so we talked manually and we talked dynamically. So let's talk a little more about how to configure a static route. On the router, we will start off in the global configuration mode. We will say IP route, and we will do remote network, and we will say basically either the next hop or exit interface. So basically, if we want to manually configure R1 to go to this guy, this network over here, the 10111 network, we could do that a few different ways. We could say forward anything using this network ID and its subnet to this IP address because it is directly connected. This is connected. This is directly connected to R1. So R1 knows that IP address. But if we do that, there is no redundancy. So if this is our network, we got three routers and we were trying to do manual IP configuration or route configuration. If this link goes down, we won't be able to function. However, we have another path we could take, but because the routes are statically assigned, the router doesn't know how to forward the data. That's a downside to static routes. Dynamic routing actually will determine the best route. So if a path becomes removed, it will forward a different path. We have routing protocols that can actually have the routers share information they know to the other routers. This basically allows us to discover remote networks, have up-to-date information, choose the appropriate path, and uh, recover if there's errors, and find new paths when appropriate. But that means we have to run a routing protocol. Realistically, routing protocols are the way to go, but sometimes static routes are called for depending on functionality. In uh, my line of work, I predominantly do dynamic routing. I very rarely do static routes, but I've had to do them a few times, so you do need to know how they function just, just in case you need to use them. So how does the routing table look on a router? If we do a show IP route on a router, we'll get this type of interface. It's a lot of information. First and foremost, this is all codes. This basically is saying, how do we learn routes? Well, we got tons of different ways. Directly connected routes with a local interface will use a L. Directly connected networks will use a C. Notice directly connected uh, local interface I addresses slightly different than directly connected networks. Directly connected networks are going to be the network ID where the directly connected network with a local address will use the actual network ID without it being summarized. And that makes a little more sense after we've talked about summarization in our IP addressing lecture. 
The third option is our static routes. They will be denoted with an S. That's typically uh, saved for our default gateways. We have other routing protocols like OSPF or EIGRP or RIP, and they are designated with their own number or their own letters. OSPF being O, EIGRP being D. So we can see what is learned and what is directly connected. You will notice that we have one network learned. That will be the 10.1.1.0 network. We learn that via OSPF, first of all, because the O and because of the metric, the 110, that's what's used for OSPF. And we can say where it's learned from. That's learned from our 209.165.200.226 interface. And we also say how long it's been active. This is just a get your feet wet with the uh, route table. We do way more in-depth lectures on decoding this route table and the functionality and breaking down every portion of this table. We do that in a much later lecture. And that is actually all for this chapter. What we learned was we learned about IP, both IPv4 and IPv6 being connectionless, best effort, uh, media independent. We learned about default gateways and we figured out what default gateways do and their functionality and kind of how they work. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out. Thank you.